भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम ज्ञानातिमिरंद ज्ञानाजनाशलाकय चक्षुरोमिलम्य तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोभीष्टा स्थापित ये नूतल स्वयं रूपा कदाम दराती स्वापदातिक वंदेह श्रीगुर श्रीयुत पदकमल श्रीगुरून वैष्णव श्री रूप सागजात सहगना रघुनाथ तम सजीव कादैत सवदूत परीरन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पदन ललिता श्री विशाखान्वित हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीन बंधो जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते आप्त कांचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी विश्वानो सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकुभ्य कृपा सिंधु पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम नमो विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूत श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नीति नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिने निविशेष शून्यवारी पाश्चातारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासरी गौर भक्त बृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण भगवान सो welcome to our nectar of devotion study so thank you for all joining today so today we're going to be discussing chapter um 16 of the nectar of devotion the bhakti rasamrita sindhu so we'll do a quick uh review of chapter 15 the topic of 15 and 16 is is the same it is discussing this very um advanced stage of sadhana bhakti this raga nuga sadhana bhakti and so we'll discuss uh, more details today about that we've discussed it a little bit earlier in this section we discussed it last week and now we'll continue uh today and then next week we'll move into discussing now bhava bhakti and we'll spend two weeks discussing bhava bhakti uh with a conclusion of discussing prema bhakti as we progress uh from the initial rungs of devotional service to the highest platform of devotional service so the ragatmika bhakta um uh, is important in understanding raganuga sadhana bhakti uh as the raganuga sadhana bhakta follows in the footsteps of this ragatmika devotee so rupa goswami last time explained and um uh, presented Uh, details on who is this ragatmika bhakti and we see this also presented in in chaitanya charitamrita so they are the eternal residents of shri vrindavan dam and their devotion is characterized by three qualities or characteristics uh one that they are completely absorbed in thoughts of krishna fully absorbed nothing else enters their consciousness uh two there is a natural inclination uh, a spontaneous inclination to serve uh it that it happens out of their own enjoyment there's no uh external oh it's time to go do your service today it happens naturally that is the second and the third and that there's a deep transcendental attachment there is this you know intense attachment to krishna so these are the three you know characteristics that describe the ragatmika bhakta the ragatmika devotee and um remember raga means this deep attachment and atmika means full or essence so they're fully attached to krishna and this we see present only in the eternal residence 
of Vrindavan. This is where this devotion we see at its ultimate, it is most intense state we see in Goloka Vrindavan. And that's been explained to us by Srila Rupa Goswami uh, and also Krishna Kabiraj Goswami in presenting Chaitanya Charita Amrita. Okay. We discussed a little bit last time about the difference between spiritual lust and material lust in discussing this conjugal relationship. We'll discuss more about this conjugal uh, mood of Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti later today. But very important to understand this distinction um, you know that lust is an intense desire to please the senses but in material lust it is an intense desire to please one's own senses whereas in uh, spiritual lust it's an intense desire to please Krishna's senses and that is the very important and stark difference it is night and day as different as night and day is is as different as material lust versus spiritual lust and so when we hear about the you know the residents of Vrindavan and their devotion you know the 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 pastime of the gopis and this madhurya rasa you know the gopis were running to be with krishna not for them to enjoy but to give Krishna pleasure. They would decorate themselves not for their pleasure or so that they may stand out in the crowd, no. but to give Krishna's eyes something pleasurable to look at. Their whole motive was Krishna's happiness, not their own. And so we must try to understand these activities in this mood. And it's very difficult because our whole existence is contaminated by material lust. So immediately we go and begin to see these with our own perspective. And so it's very dangerous. Uh, and thus it's advised that even these pastimes should be heard after one has progressively you know, understood um, the uh, initial uh, activities of the Lord. And so I recommend that one should read Srimad Bhagavatam from beginning to end. Uh, so that by the time one gets to these pastimes, one is sufficiently purified. Okay. Now there's Raganuga, Sadhana Bhakta, versus Ragatnika. So a couple important, you know, characteristics. Raganuga again is the practice, keyword practice, of spontaneous devotion, whereas Ragatnika is the perfection of spontaneous devotion. So both are spontaneous. But Raganuga, remember, is in sadhana bhakti, right? And ragatmika bhakti is is perfected. It is Krishna prema, right? So one is in practice, and the Raganuga bhakti it is the practice of advanced devotees with an intention to cultivate the sentiments of a particular eternal resident of Goloka Vrindavan. So one follows a particular Ragatmika devotee. Right? So one follows one in a specific rasa, and there is an intense desire to serve as a friend, as a parent, as a conjugal lover, or as a servant. Right? So one follows like Mother Yashoda or Nanda Baba, or one of the cowherd boys like Subal, or one of the gopis and their servants. So there is a specific devotee that inspires one's in intense desire to serve in this spontaneous mood. So this is the um, um, position of the Raghunuga Bhakti, Bhakta. You know, and one wants to, for example, make garlands for Krishna, or one wants to prepare milk sweets for Krishna, or one wants to decorate his resting place, or help him herd the cows, like this. These, these certain activities become very attractive to one who is purified to this Raganuga stage, and we'll talk about what it means to qualify, but that is the the position. Right? So again, Ragatmika is in Krishna Prema, while the Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti is in the Sadhana stage. So it is the practice of spontaneous devotion. So very important, and one must follow this following characteristic we see over and over and over and over again in our devotional service. You know, Rupa Goswami explained that it is one of the critical 
um, aspects of success in devotional service in the third verse of Nectar of Instruction, Sato Vritihi. That one must follow the previous acharyas. In describing pure devotional service, Anushilana means to follow in the footsteps of the previous devotees. And we see again here this Raganuga Sadhana. It is to follow. So even in this advanced stage, one is following. And that's important uh, throughout our Krishna consciousness and often is the most difficult for us, particularly as we progress, you know, this tendency to, I know now, you know, because I have been here for some time, that manifest. So we should try to cultivate this mood of following um, very importantly. Okay? So what is the basic qualification to achieve Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti? Right? So the how to get there, we should understand. So the basic qualification is this intense desire to serve Krishna in this specific relationship following one of the residents of Vrindavan. It is a natural, spontaneous desire. And the desire is of intense nature. It is not, yeah, that'd be nice. Oh, I'd like to do this. But it is an intense desire to uh, serve. That is the basic qualification. Right? And again, to follow a specific or particular residence of Vrindavan. And how does this develop, one may ask? It develops by hearing, um, by hearing about the various pastimes of Vrindavan. You know, by reading Krishna book, by hearing the writings of our previous acharyas, the six Goswamis, one begins to covet a particular type of devotion. One pastime or one activity begins to become very prominent in one's consciousness. You know, one begins to gradually meditate. Uh, on these types of activities. So that is how it develops. It develops by hearing uh, the various pastimes. But the qualification is this intense desire. And when the intense desire develops to serve, then again, no longer is the impetus of the regulator principles required to get one to perform bhakti. You know, right now, we can you know, do a self-reflection and say, Am I chanting today because I love to chant? Or am I chanting today because I, made a, I took a vow to chant? Right? Therein lies the distinction between Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti and Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Right? The impetus. So the intense desire is the catalyst. Right? There is an intense craving that exists. And this craving is of to attain the service of a particular resident, right? And this devotee then guides exactly what to do. So the guiding principle of the Raganuga devotee is the activities of that Ragatmika devotee, not necessarily the regulator principles. Right? And in Chaitanya Chaitamrita we see this verse that you know, when an advanced devotee, when an advanced realized devotee hears about the affairs of the devotees of Vrindavan in the mellows of Santa, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsali, and Madhurya, he becomes inclined in this way and his intelligence becomes attracted. Indeed, he begins to covet that particular type of devotion. When such covetedness is awakened, one's intelligence no longer depends on the instruction of Shastra, revealed scripture, logic, or argument. That's uh, Madhya Lila Chaitanya Chaitamrita, 22nd chapter, verse 155. We read many verses last time about the Ragatmika Bhakta from uh, this same section. So, again, the advanced devotee hears about the affairs of the devotees of Vrindavan in the different mellows. Then he becomes inclined in this way, and his intelligence becomes attracted, and then he begins to covet that particular type of devotion. Right? So this is the process of how it comes, this intense desire, and it comes from hearing. Right? So then, you know, when 
does this intense desire develop? You know, I have some desire maybe, but I need intense desire. When will that come? We may ask. So um, Rupa Goswami and Srila Prabhupada comment that the main qualification for this loba, this intense desire is called loba, is it comes when one is free from all material attachments. Right? So the definition of this desire is one's exclusive and overwhelming desire. <laughs> we can think, how many desires do I have in my heart? <laughs> but when one's exclusive and overwhelming desire to serve Krishna following a ragatmika devotee is there, then we know we have achieved this uh, uh, loba, this qualification. Right? So, it is not cheap or easy to obtain. It is not cheap. It has to uh, become our exclusive desire and overwhelming. Let's explain. So, this is um, you know the goal, and we see you know a child sitting in front of a piece of candy has an overwhelming and almost exclusive desire for that candy. Like that, our consciousness twenty four seven can be of serving in the particular devotee's footsteps. That's the type of intensity we're looking for. So it's not cheap or easy, right? And we understand that intense greed for something comes when we are single-minded, right? If I want seven things, if I have seven desires in my heart, then the intensity of my desires is split among the seven things. But when I become single-minded, then all of my effort and all of my consciousness becomes intensified in that one matter. Right? I want this, but I also want this, but I also want that. Well, then our individual wants become diluted by the wants of others. Right? So when we become single-minded, and that single-minded basically means we become free of all other desires, all of our material desires, gone. So this intense desire develops when we are anarta nivritti, free of all other material contamination. Then there can be a real intensity. Otherwise, yes, I want to follow in the footsteps of this devotee, which is nice, but I also want, you know, to uh, have this position. I want to eat this type of prasad. I want to have this type of service. I want this. Right? These are all desires that develop, not necessarily even material desires, right? Let alone having need for some money or I want some, you know, position or this or that. But even sometimes in devotion, there are some desires, right? So when we become free of all of those and exclusively desirous of this position, then there can be the type of intensity required to bring about Raga Nuga Sadhana Bhakti. So, you know, we may have some desire today, and our goal is to try to cultivate it to this type of intensity. But again, the cultivation doesn't happen by, okay, I just need to be desirous. It happens by removing all the other desires. So, it is by the purification through sadhana bhakti. Right? Vaidhi sadhana bhakti is what will carry us forward from shraddha, to Sada Sangha, to Bhajana Kriya, to Anurta Nivritti, and ultimately Nishta. It is our Vaidhi Sadhana principles that will purify the heart, remove these material attachments, and thus allow this intense desire to awaken. So we have to try to cultivate the desire by hearing nicely, but we also have to bring about this desire by removing the material contamination. And that happens through the perfection of our Vaidhi Sadhana principles. Right? Remember, going prematurely to Raganuga Bhakti, following the spontaneous desire, will take us in a very bad and wrong direction. So this Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti actually is carried forward as we think about the nine steps from Shraddha to Prema. The first four steps Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivritti. Until Anartha Nivritti, one is in the Vaidhi Sadhana platform. 
Once one reached nishta, the fixed state, then Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti begins. From nishta to ruchi to a shakti is in this Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti, and then the eighth step is Bhava Bhakti. Right? So that's important. And again, you know, if we try to become naturally inclined before anartha nivritti, the anarthas in our heart will guide our consciousness. So until we are completely free of material contamination, we must follow the regulative principles of devotional service. You know, it's like riding a bike. And if you take the training wheels off too early, what happens? You fall down. So don't be eager to take off the training wheels of Vedi Sadhana Bhakti. Because if you do it before the heart is purified, we'll fall down. Okay? So to keep us on track, these principles are very important. So again, just to summarize, the basic qualification is this intense greed, and this develops when one is free from all material contaminations, inert and liberty. So this is how one achieves Raga Nuga Bhakti. Now let's discuss this very important process of these regulator principles of devotional service. Right? When we say that Raga Nuga Sadhana Bhakti is above the regulator principles, we must have extraordinary clear understanding of what this means. Otherwise we'll enter into the Sahajya realms of, of, of practice and not a good place to be. So the regulator principles of devotional service, they do not drive the Raganuga Bhakta to service. Rather, this intense craving to serve like one of the residents of Vrindavan, that is what inspires one. So they don't need the regulator principles of devotional service for the inspiration to serve and surrender. That happens naturally out of their own intense desire. It happens out of their love. But they follow the regular principles of bhakti. And that is very important. So they follow them, but they are not required to inspire one to serve and surrender. So, you know, just like the example of, you can use of, you know, a devotee automatically follows the four regular principles. Right? A devotee is automatically a vegetarian. They don't have to think, I'm a veg I need to be a vegetarian. They just are because they only honor Krishna Prasad. So like that, the Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti, Bhakta, he's automatically chanting and reading Srimad Bhagavatam and associating with devotees. But the inspiration to do so comes from this natural craving. Right? So this is very, very important. Then the next piece is how one actually practices bhakti, this Raganuga bhakti. Because we have to be careful not to become a pretender. So one internally has this mood of this spontaneous attraction serving in the footsteps of a particular devotee. But externally, they show themselves as a neophyte devotee. Because showing these symptoms externally is very dangerous. One will become very prideful. Oh, wow, look at this devotee. He is, you know, following in the footsteps of Subal and, and running in the cowherd, uh, in the forest with the cowherd boys. One will acquire cheap adoration and ultimately one will fall from that platform. So one must uh, internally can meditate, but externally shows themselves as a neophyte devotee. And we see this in our Guru Parampara as the very important process, even when this awakens within us. And how long one should follow the rules and regulations of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti? As long as we are in this body, we should follow. And again, this is important. These are not the four regulative principles. No meat eating, intoxication, illicit sex, and gambling. When we speak about regulative principles of Bhakti, we're speaking about the 64 Angas of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Chanting and reading, taking initiation, serving in the temple, watering tulsi, all these activities. One should not think, oh, I don't have to do those now. I am now advanced. No, this becomes the core of one's existence. 
But the inspiration to do it, again, like the chanting, one doesn't chant because they took a vow, they chant because they are naturally in love with glorifying the Lord. Right? So Rupa Goswami con- recommends that one continue these regular principles even after developing this spontaneous love. And we see Srila Prabhupada, he never f- stopped following the Vaidhi Savana principles. But he was a pure devotee of Krishna. You know? He says that even a pure devotee must never give up these regular principles. So we cannot you know, speak enough about this topic. It's very, very important. Right? So even if one realizes their eternal position, you know, everybody has an eternal position of service in the spiritual world, if one realizes that, one thinks within oneself about these spontaneous services and meditates on it while doing the Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. So the external display of Rasa Sadhana Bhakti is n- never recommended by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Rupa Goswami. And of course our Guru Parampara since. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very careful in showing his own ecstatic uh, symptoms of Krishna Prema. It was very confidential. Okay? So, and important again, just keep re-emphasizing, it is not that one, you know, oh, I've reached Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti, I don't need my bead bag anymore. Yeah. No, these Vaidhi Sadhana principles become the essence of even the Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. Right? So, it is uh, very, very important. And we should also be careful in observing these symptoms and others. Sometimes we see people, you know, Prabhupada would guide us, you know, very carefully. Don't, you know, judge. You see somebody crying and dancing. Ex- Don't try to ascertain where they are. It is not for our uh, position. It may be legitimate and it may be an external show. <laughs> so very important um, is the position of the regulator principles. Again, I'll say it one more time just for extraordinary emphasis that the regulator principles of devotional service do not serve as the impetus for the Raganuga devotee to serve, but they become the full activity of that Raganuga devotee. But their impetus is out of that natural inclination, that intense craving. So, pardon the repetition, but just to help make sure it's very clear for us. So, finally, we'll discuss the three practices of Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti, three uh, verses are given in the uh, uh, Ways of Devotion uh, study guide and also presented in the um, in, in, uh, in paces in the um, presentation by Srila Prabhupada of this chapter. So the first is that, you know, w- the first practice of a Raganaga Sadhana Bhakta is they think about a particular devotee serving Krishna and Rindavan, right? They meditate on this relationship between Krishna and his devotee. And the specific relationship is, is based on our natural inclination, right? Some have a natural inclination to Mother Yashoda or Nanda Baba or Subal or the Gopis. Or, and, and so a particular relationship inspires one. And so, again, to facilitate this meditation, one is encouraged to live in Rindavan and meditate on Krishna and his devotees, right? But importantly, if one cannot physically be in Rindavan, more important than physically being in Rindavan is to have one's mind in Rindavan, to meditate on that situation in Rindavan. Because you can be physically in Rindavan, but if you're meditating about you know, something else, then that physical presence also isn't as beneficial. Right? So the key here, the first practice, is to meditate on that particular devotee and bring our consciousness to Rindavan so we can begin to uh, experience these pastimes. Two is to do actual service, practical service, following in the footsteps of that devotee. So again, you know, um, and uh, in the ways of devotion, this is uh, explained very clearly about the external and the internal. Right? Externally, one presents one as a neophyte, but internally, one is doing that service. And every eternal resident, they have a sadhaka form and a siddha form. The sadhaka form is the, you know, the mood in the form of a devotee practicing. You know, so 
in in our immediate case that is Rupa Goswami and Rupa Goswami in his Siddha form is Rupa Manjari so externally one follows the Sadaka form follows how Rupa Goswami was chanting and residing in Rindavan and performing all of his sadhana but internally one is meditating on you know Rupa Manjari being one of the Manjaris one of the intimate servants of the gopis and how they are you know performing various pastimes right so one example of this is Narutam Das Thakur Narutam Das Thakur was one of the assistants to Champakleta uh, Devi the gopi right one of the eight principal um, gopis was Champakleta and he was her <coughs> assistant and his eternal form was to boil the milk to make sweets that Champakalata was making sweets for Krishna so Narutam Das Thakur's um, uh, uh, we can say um, eternal service was to boil the milk so while he was sitting in the temple room he would be meditating and he would be chanting his japa but internally he was meditating on this service to boiling the milk and this meditation would become so intense that sometimes he would his hands would burn from the splashing of the boiling milk but what was he doing if you saw him in the temple you would see he was sitting and chanting his japa but internally his meditation was of this so we can see how one performs that so that we meditate on that specific service but it is an internal and then the third is one follows the Vaidhi principles. One never rejects the Vaidhi principles. But in fact, <clears throat> they shape their Vaidhi activities to nourish this specific mood. You know, in their hearing. One might hear about these specific pastimes. In their chanting, not only their japa, but their other chanting, they may recite, you know, different uh, prayers or different uh, songs about this particular service. They may do deity worship in the particular mood. So they bring their Vaidhi principles in coordination with this type of service. Right? So that's how one performs. So these are the, the practices. And just finally, this uh, important aspect of direct versus indirect service. So there are two aspects of this conjugal and sambandha, this relationship with uh, in Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti. And one is direct and one is indirect. Some desire to have direct contact with Krishna. And others have more enjoyment hearing and serving others who have direct contact with Krishna. So the indirect is in, in happiness in bringing Radha and Krishna together. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu never, 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 and never. Um, supported this direct service to Krishna. He always said, Das and Das and Das and Das. Only wanted to be the servant of the servant of the servant. And there's a very important reason why. We must understand this and try to develop this mood within us. That the devotee, the pure devotee, their only desire is to see Krishna happy. And they know that Radharani is the only one who can give Krishna the most happiness. Nobody can give happiness. The devotee thinks, wait a minute, if I am serving Krishna directly, I cannot give the same happiness that Radharani can give. So instead, let me try to assist Radharani in giving service to Krishna. But wait a minute, Radharani has so many assistants. I cannot assist Radharani like Lalita Devi can. So instead, let me assist Lalita Devi in serving Radharani, who is serving Krishna. Well, wait a minute. I cannot give as much happiness as one of the manjaris of Lalita Devi. So let me become the servant of the servant of the servant. Because my goal is to what can give Krishna the most happiness. So this is the mood that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is trying to awaken in all of our hearts. When he says dasana, 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 he is speaking not here in the material world. He is speaking in the spiritual world. 
And that is why our Goswamis, you know, they're all manjaris. They're not the direct servants of Krishna. They are the assistants to the gopis who are assisting the pleasure of Krishna and Srimati Radharani. So this is very, very important. In uh, class, Borijan Prabhu gives, he, you know, he discusses this, you know, this, this um, bhajan that we often hear, this Radhe Radhe Shama Se Milade. That is not a bona fide bhajan. The devotee doesn't say, Radhe Radhe, give me Sham. No. Instead, the devotee says, Radhe Radhe, you be with Sham. Let me assist you. The devotee does not want from Radharani, Krishna. The devotee wants the opportunity to serve Krishna through the mercy of Srimati Radharani. So this is why we also should be very careful because sometimes these things, oh, that sounds very, very sweet, you know, but it is actually, it is not bona fide. And that's why Srila Prabhupada was very adamant, you know, in, in the temple. He said, you know, we should not sing all these other Bhajans. We should only sing the Mahamantra and our Gaudiya Vaishnava Bhajan. That's it. He actually forbade all other things. He was often asked, you know, very famously, he was asked, you know, by um, one of the disciples during Ram Nomi, what should we chant, Prabhupada? Should we chant some, you know, different glorifications? He said, you chant the Mahamantra. That is glorification of Lord Ram. Uh, when ch in the different festivals, he always said, "Just chant the Mahamantra." And why? Because sometimes these things, you know, if we're not fully aware, they can creep in. And so, you know, Srila Prabhupada was very careful. Only Mahamantra and our Gaudiya Vaishnava Bhajan. That is it. That are the only things we should sing. So we should be careful, because uh, sometimes, like even on Janmashtami, you know, sometimes these other you know, sort of bhajans come up. And uh, Srila Prabhupada was very, you know, mindful that even in Janmasmi that, you know, we should only chant the Mao Mantra. Uh, it, everything else is included within it. So, just a, a quick side note. Um, so this direct service is there, but it is fraught with dangers. So, instead, we follow our, you know, our, our Goswamis. They are, were all manjuris, the servants of the gopis. So there's other clarifications that are made towards the end of the, the chapter. You know, the, the mood of our service, it has nothing to do with our body. You know, if I'm a male, it doesn't mean that this madhurya rasa is, you know, not possible. This is just a material body, right? Males can also have the conjugal mood. And the reference is given to the sages of the Dandakaranya forest. They were so attracted by the beauty of Lord Ram that they became the, you know, blessed to take birth in the wombs of the Raja Gopis, right? And this is explained in the 10th canto. They were the entry-level Gopis. They came from the, they were the sages from Dandakaranya, okay? So, uh, it is not about male and female. And then, finally, there was some discussion about this, you know, conjugal relationship <coughs> in the marriage and and of the lover, this parikya bhav. This, um, you know, parikya bhav is the highest intense desire of love. And, you know, um, the, the gopis were not necessarily married to Krishna, but whereas the queens of Dwarka were married to Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada presents that. We won't discuss too much of that, but that is just one distinction we can understand. Um, and then finally, even in the Sambandha um, Rupa, this uh, relationship of Raghunaga Bhakti, there's also this direct and indirect. And very important, you know, if one has this Vatsalya Bhav, you know, one cannot become Nanda Baba or Yashodamai. Krishna's mother and father, they are eternally there. But one can assist them in the service. So one should be very careful not to develop this direct mood of wanting to be Nanda Baba or Yashodamai Rupa Goswami guide that this is Mayavad philosophy. You know, trying to become someone else. That is not possible. So, okay, so again, a little, this, these chapters are a little bit deep and intense, but uh, also very important. So, 
Any um, discussion, comments, questions we can have today? Krishna Prabhu, I was going through that chapter, I had some doubt. In mm -hmm. that, uh, when you say that Dandakaranya, the sages were thinking that uh, they know that Krishna will come and they can be the gopis uh, mentioned. But uh, it was in a uh, Treta Yuga, they know already Dwapar Yuga will come. Yeah. Everybody, you know that you, you know that Kali Yuga is here. You know Satyuga is coming next. Okay. Right? You know Satyuga is coming next. You know that we are on the 28th Manvantara of Vaivasvata Manu. Right? So in Shastra, everything is... It doesn't make us, you know, some, you know, wow, I can see the future. No, the future is written in Shastra. So when Krishna is coming, all of that is given in Shastra. So they knew that Krishna would be coming. They had this desire. So one more thing I didn't understand. Can you yeah. go to the side? Because I, don't, I didn't follow exactly that side is. In the regulative principles, second one is internally meditate on spontaneous mood of sir, while externally show as a new, new, new type devotee. What is it internally? Uh, if we have to make it or external, we should act as any. What exactly mean? I didn't get at this. Yeah, so like I gave the example of uh, Narottam Das Thakur, right? So internally, while one is chanting their japa, one is meditating on this particular service that is very attractive to them. You know, I am chanting my japa, and oh, I am making flower garlands for Krishna as he prepares to swing in the forest of Vrindavan with his beloved Srimati Radharani and I'm getting to go and pick the flowers from the forest. This flower looks very nice and that flower looks very nice. So internally, my consciousness is meditating like this. But externally, I am sitting in a temple room and I'm chanting my japa. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Right? So internally, but one doesn't, you know, start to show this. Oh, I'm going to pick flowers from Krishna and externally. Oh, look, guys, I'm making these flowers for Krishna and Goloka Vrindavan. No, that is an external show. So internally, one's meditation follows that mood, right? If you're in the, you have a particular affinity to cowherd boys, well, internally, while you're chanting your japa, you are meditating on strolling through the fields and playing with Krishna and climbing the trees and serving him and the cows. Like, so one's mind and consciousness is meditating there. But again, externally, one is doing that. Or let's say you are dressing the deities and one is dressing Krishna, meditating on, oh, he is getting ready to go to the forest, you know, like that. So again, externally, you're doing all of your Vaidhi principles. But internally, one's consciousness, meditation, moves towards the particular service of that Ragatmika devotee. Is it clear? Yeah, good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. We should have good clarity of this. We do not want to, again, artificially or become a pretender. That's very important. And remember, this stage of bhakti develops by the performance of our Vaidhi principles that purify us of our material contamination. So our intense desire will happen when we are free from all other desires, when we become single-minded, and that is anartha nivritti, which actually fully we are not free of our anarthas until bhava bhakti, or actually prema bhakti, but we can say mostly free of our anarthas. So this raganuga sadhana bhakti is a very high stage, right? It is at the stage of nishta. Any other questions or comments? Any realizations from this topic? Okay. So if there's nothing else, then uh, next one. Yeah. Yes, perfect. 
the whole mark that I mentioned something like nine stage or something I was going to read in front of me. Yeah. The nine stages is right. This yeah. Shraddha Taprema. Can I I think we didn't cover today that one. No, that's covered from the nectar of instruction. Remember the nine stages from Shraddha to Prema? Okay. Okay, okay. So that Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Narta Nibritti, Nishta, Ruchi, Ashapti. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yes. Yeah, Hare Krishna Guruji. Yes. Uh, sadhana Bhakti, when you are doing, I mean, I know you said in Raghunuka Bhakti, that's the time that one meditates on a particular thing internally and then externally we, one will practice still the regulative principles uh, out of their own inclination rather than um, mm. um, needed to do yes. uh, the natural inclination but uh, what about in that so this meditation thing will come only after the um, anartha nivrati so uh, what about in sadhana bhakti one sees some devotees may be kind of inclined towards um, sure. um, towards a particular thing, right? So, um, a particular form of Krishna. So, how do we understand that? Yeah, it, that is. We don't that. understand that. Yeah, no, no, it's a nice question. So, um, you know, in Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, you may actually obtain glimpses of Raghunaga Sadhana Bhakti. You know, there may be moments where, wow, I am chanting, I am having so much pleasure in chanting. I just want to keep going. There's like, again, that natural inclination will come, right? It comes in glimpses. And those glimpses are meant to inspire us to achieve this, you know, full state, right? So even in Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, you may get some glimpses of this Raghunaga experience. And I want to run to the temple or I want to run to see Krishna you know the, again sometimes during festivals or if you're traveling in the holy dams you know you get this you know these glimpses of Raghunuga Bhakti so they happen even while we are in the Vaidhi Sadhana stage so while we're in the Vaidhi Sadhana stage you know as you're reading and you're experiencing the different pastimes yeah you'll start to feel possibly some natural inclination towards particular you know devotees or whatnot or particular aspects, again, particular types of service. And, you know, you can cultivate those. You can let them happen. But don't be, we should be, you know, this Siddha Pranali, I did not discuss it. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's a premature, you know, declaration. Oh, I am this, you know, eternal, this is my eternal service. You know, there's a premature declaration. So um, that we don't want to do, you know. That, uh, and this, this used to happen. The gurus used to actually reveal one's eternal. We all have an eternal service. And we are in a process of exploring what that is. So in our Vaidhi principles, what we do is we let them come out. Yeah, oh, wow, I really enjoy this pastime. Okay, cultivate that. Keep reading about that pastime. Keep learning more. You know, don't become fixed. That, oh, this is my now, you know, my eternal Siddha Rupa. Right? It may or may not be. Let that happen naturally. But... We should cultivate those, you know, oh, I'm, I am very fond of reading about the cowherd boys in Krishna. Oh, it's so nice. Or I'm very fond of the activities of this particular gopi and how she assists Radharani in serving Krishna. Oh, let me learn more about that. That's okay. Right? We can cultivate that. So cultivate it, but also don't prematurely become, oh, this is who I am. Right? Let that also happen naturally. And... Uh, so it's good, and, and that's the whole purpose of studying this, you know, Raghunaga Bhakti is to, you know, oh, I can start to hear more and see where does my mind and heart, and you'll find as you purify, as the anartas are removed, it may change. So don't be bewildered, you know, as you move through it, because, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has explained that, you know, anyone who is following in uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's footsteps has the opportunity to awaken this Madhurya Rasa. Right? All the uh, associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they're all serving in this Madhurya Rasa. So we may have initially a mood of Santa Rasa, or Dasya Rasa, or Sakya Rasa, or Vatsalya Rasa, 
but it may change as one purifies. So uh, begin to cultivate it, experience it, don't become fixed in it yet. Let it happen naturally. Is that okay, Mataji? Thank you so much. It's just more of an observation of how I see other devotees. <laughs> Nothing related to me. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and but again, let me just make it. Be careful how we observe other devotees. Better try not to observe too much in that regard, or at least don't make conclusive understandings. We may appreciate, wow, this devotee is serving so nicely in this movie, which I think is your intention. So, um, you know, and that's good. We can appreciate that, but don't. Um, take it a little bit too far and say, oh, this person must be this type of devotee and this, you know, maybe let's not make those assumptions. Let's appreciate and glorify one's, you know, service and how they're serving, but maybe not take it quite to the realm of making any conclusions on their, you know, mood of service and whatnot. Again, we, we should appreciate and glorify others and how they are so sincerely serving in different ways. That is part of our purification process. So basically appreciate to the extent that it can inspire you and then just leave it at that. Right? Yeah, perfect. That's a, that, that's a well said. You know, appreciate it to the point of becoming inspired by, but don't try to, again, and it's different. Like internally, we may, you know, appreciate and, and almost lavish over, but externally, you know, we don't want to also put that person in a position, right, of, like becoming potentially, oh yeah, I am, the, you know, we don't, again, depending on who it is, you know, when we're in the midst of our spiritual master, we glorify so much out of love. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, you know, we, we appreciate and recognize um, for the purpose of being inspiring. And, you know, we should appreciate and recognize the services of those that actually, you know, sometimes we don't quote unquote like you know, because our heart becomes contaminated by this like and dislike. You know, where is this envy? So, appreciating the service of someone that, you know, maybe we have a little bit of envy of, actually is very liberating, very purifying. It's very sweet, actually. So we should appreciate... Uh, oh, but we should also be careful, you know, who we become inspired by. So I'll take the other side of that also. Because, you know, if we, you know, this bhakti is becoming inspired by the ragatmika bhakta, right? So, Rupa Goswami is being very precise in this, this guy. I mean, ultimately, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has established this. Very precise. So, we must be also very careful, you know, where we draw our association and inspiration from. You know, we, again, respect and love all. But internally, where we really draw our inspiration from, we should be very mindful and careful. Because what we observe externally isn't always what we see. And ultimately, Krishna will, re will be, reveal it to us. But we should be you know, very, very careful um, where we draw our deep inner inspiration from. We can draw general inspiration from many, but our deep inner inspiration we should be a little bit um, careful, I guess is what I'll, how I'll say. So, uh, last question. So basically, for a sadhana bhakta, uh, the, just like for ragana bha raganuga bhaktas, they are following in the footsteps of ragatmika bhakta. Now, for sadhana bhakta, now they need to follow in the footsteps of Guru Maharaj if they have a spiritual master. 